All right, y'all put your hands together like this. Come on. Stand up to your feet. Come on. A little more like mercy. Come on. A little more like grace. A little more like kindness. Goodness. Love and Confess I still need her to see the way you see. Oh. Somebody with a hurt that I could have helped. Somebody with a hand that I could have held. When I just can't see past myself, Lord help me be a little more like mercy. A little more like grace. A little more like kindness. Goodness. Love and faith. You can have a seat. My name is Justin. I am the high school pastor here at North Point Community Church. And a special welcome to all the Auburn fans in the room who may be here today because yesterday you said, God, give us a touchdown and I'll come to church. So congratulations. You squeaked by. You're here today. We're glad you're here. We're glad all of you are here. It's a great day uh, in the Be Rich season. I love the words of that song. When I can't see past myself, make me more like Jesus and less like me. That's exactly what Be Rich is all about. It is our initiative of generosity here at North Point Church, where we want to serve and give and love on our community through this season. And so last week, we asked that you would all donate some money to help uh, the local community around here, 100% of which is given away into the community. And you guys were exceedingly generous as always. Andy will be here to share and celebrate the number soon. They don't give me that information. I don't know why, but maybe they don't trust me. But if you weren't here last week, or maybe you forgot your wallet in the car, or you're just tuning in with us, we wanna give you a chance to take part in giving uh, towards that initiative. So I'm gonna put that squiggly box you've been seeing at restaurants for the menu up on the screen. There's a QR code. If you would, pull out your phone, open the camera, point it at that, don't take a picture, okay? I know we're all tempted to, I've got an album full of accidental QR codes. But just put it in front of the QR code, a link will pop at the top. That'll take you to our top three website where you can give um, to that initiative. This week is one of my favorite weeks of the Be Rich season, it is the Serve Week. And I'm gonna give you a really unique, a really practical, easy way to partner with us in serving our community in a second. But first, I want you to see a video about some very special people, check it out. Teachers have been asked to change and reorder everything around them. Shut down classes, order masks, adapt lessons, focus on virtual learning, deliver meals to families, offer digital support, teach PE through a screen, teach science without a lab, teach humanities at a distance. Teachers have stepped into many roles, germ killer, temperature taker, contact tracer. Struggling with feelings of self-doubt, fear, and decision fatigue, teachers put students above their own needs. The days were difficult, but one thing remained the same, their love for their students. Our sons, our daughters, our transit small groups, our inside out freshmen, our upstreet kindergartners, Teachers held parades for our children. They hand-delivered art supplies for projects. They became a welcoming face as they held story times on video calls. Teachers
Teachers proved that they are more than a member of our community. They are a partner, a mentor. They are heroes. No matter the challenge, they keep stepping up. Now, it's our turn to encourage them, to remind them that they are seen, they are valued, and that they are loved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, teachers. Genuinely. As somebody who works with high school students, I, I've, I've been able to witness and attest to how big a role a teacher plays in a student's life. There's maybe no bigger person that partners with the parents as far as influencing a student as a teacher. And so we thought it would be incredible to serve our teachers who innovated through this last season and our students benefited from more than we'll probably ever understand by giving them a note of encouragement. So today, when you all leave, you'll see some people waving these in your face and there'll be tables around the church where you can grab a card and at the top of the card, you're gonna see a teacher's name, some information about them, the school they work at, and their address. And on the bottom of the card, there's gonna be a blank space for you to take a few moments and just write a note of encouragement to a teacher in our community. Then you're gonna peel this bottom part off and you're gonna slap a stamp on the envelope we provide and you're gonna mail that to them this week. This is an incredible way for us to gather around them and say, hey, we see you, we appreciate you, and we love you, thank you. And so if you're watching online, we don't want you to be left out in this as well. You can go to northpoint.org slash top three and you can find an opportunity to do the same thing. Now that's the practical, easy way to get involved with the serve initiative of Be Rich. But there are 5,000 serving opportunities that you also can engage in in the coming weeks. And if you go to northpoint.org slash top three, you can go on there and see all 5,000 opportunities available. I would encourage you in this season to be a little more like Jesus and a little less like me and jump in and begin to serve our community. It's gonna be an amazing morning. You've picked a great morning to be here. We get to celebrate Heath's story through baptism. And then we get my good friend. Yes, thank you. There they are. And then we get to hear from my good friend and ex-ping pong partner, Clay Scroggins. He has a very special message for us today. Clay, we miss you. Uh, but first, I'd invite you to stand as Taylor and Allison are gonna lead us in singing. Say hello to the person next to you. We're gonna jump right in.
love for you to take a seat as we celebrate alongside Heath and his journey today. Let's take a look. My name is Heath Wells. Uh, I did not grow up going to church. Uh, my life was mainly about having fun and experiencing as much as I could in life. Over time, my life felt like a swinging pendulum that began to torment me. There were the high highs that swung into the low lows, and eventually it began to wear on me spiritually, mentally, and physically. I came to North Point unchurched, and it felt like such a welcoming place. It was like an outreach hand and was there for me really before I had much to offer. Andy's first message that I heard was the follow series, and I remember thinking that it was such a great message because I knew that I didn't have to change anything just yet. And based on that, I just vowed to keep coming back. Andy said in one of his messages that God could use all my experiences for the benefit of others, that God wasn't ashamed of me or embarrassed by me. So I knew that before I could truly follow Jesus, it was going to require me to give up some things, and that scared me to death. But I decided to just turn in his direction and follow Jesus and see what happens. So on July 29th, 2019, I decided to give up something that I felt created a huge wall between me and God. I decided to give up drinking. I decided to place my faith in Jesus, and the first few months were hard, but what I have been given in return has been more than I could have ever expected. Letting go and letting God has, has led me to where I am now and led me to you know, having this peace and having this freedom and having the confidence and having, you know, all these things that, that God promised in the beginning that I was scared of, quite honestly. Now I'm leading a group of guys in transit and I'm also participating in recovery meetings, which are two things that I couldn't have done without His grace. I am so thankful that God brought me my small group, my friend Tom Coughlin, my wife Alexis, my children Wyatt, Shelby, and Vivian to help lead me where I am now. And my decision to surrender and follow Jesus changed everything. Amen. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing your testimony with us, Heath. It's amazing when we make a decision like you did, in your case, to just keep coming back at first, and then something happened. And today, You've often told me that you wanted to be a light in this world. Today, you are a light to so many, and the light of Jesus is shining directly through you, my friend. And today, I get to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. with me. God, that kind of love is something to celebrate. God, that kind of life transformation is something to celebrate. And God, the grace that you give us to make those changes in our lives, we'll never be able to thank you enough. God, the love that you show us, God, the love that covers whatever we grew up with, God, whatever we're going through, God, 
the joy that comes with knowing you. God, we're just grateful for it. We love singing to you. We love worshiping you. God, and we pray that we would be able to just pour back a fraction of that love back to you. Because it's that massive. It's, it's just incredible. God, we love you so much. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Hey guys, thanks so much for singing with us. Y'all can go ahead and take a seat. Good morning, everyone. Hope you're feeling good or hello to you, whatever time of day it is. Uh, it's good to see you. Good to see you. My name's Clay. Uh, for those of you who I haven't met, uh, my name is still Clay, uh, whether I've met you or not. So, um, but it is so good to see you. I know we got a lot of people in the West, a lot of people watching online. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for being with us today. A lot of partner churches. Uh, so many people to say hello to. Um, it's so good to see you. Uh, I want to um, start with this little phrase, and I would love for you to fill in the blank here. Desperate times call for Desperate measures. You said that so sarcastically. Desperate measures. What else you got? Give me something harder. Yeah, desperate times call for desperate measures. You, you know this phrase, right? I mean, this is a, we, we've, you've said it. We use it in uh, everyday conversation, right? Uh, the, the idea of this phrase, what this line really means is that there are times where the circumstances are adverse. They're, they're not going your way. You wouldn't have drawn it up this way. You're not necessarily wishing it would have happened this way. It just, it is what it is. And so therefore there are now actions that would have otherwise been deemed unacceptable that may actually become the best choice. They may actually become the thing that you actually do because the desperate times have called for them. Uh, when I was thinking about this little line, I thought about my own particular life. When was the last time I can remember my 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 desperate situation, allowing for these desperate measures. Um, you've got your own story as well. Um, mine, uh, the first one that came to my mind happened about 10 years ago. Um, I was uh, sitting at Cracker Barrel having breakfast. Uh, it was a wonderful morning. I was in that season of life. You ever had these seasons where uh, you're kind of focused on not letting your technology win, you know, trying to be more present with the, the person that you're with. And so um, I, I didn't have my ringer on. I had the, the phone turned face down. I was not paying it any attention, uh, despite the fact that my wife was nine months pregnant. <laughs> we, had had a, we had had a child uh, at the time. We had a two-year-old. So two years previous to this, we had a, a, a lovely little girl and my wife was pregnant again. And um, the, the previous delivery was an induction it was a scheduled induction. She was induced, okay? Now, we've got all kinds of opinions about everything in the world. Some of you, you don't, you're not, you don't think favorably of inductions. And I, I can tell you the last thing I need right now is your judgment. So, um, and, and, I, and, and I say that knowing that you will willingly give it to me um, and you are welcome to, but I'm just telling you I don't need it. Um, nonetheless, the second child was coming and was scheduled to be induced the next day. So in my mind, the thing that I loved about the idea of the induction is it felt scheduled. We weren't having a baby today. We're having a baby tomorrow. So I'm sitting there with this uh, gentleman who was a previous professor of mine in graduate school. And my wife and I both were friends with him and took his class and he was in town for something. And so we were getting together to have breakfast. I'm so, so glad to see this old friend and we were catching up. Uh, we were in such deep conversation that again, wasn't paying any attention to my phone. And I um, get into the parking lot after I'd said goodbye and uh, look at my phone. I had 17 missed phone calls <laughs> from the love of my life. And I also had a series of text messages that um, I, I, I guess the best way to put it is they, they escalated in severity. <laughs> the, they, they escalated in, their, in the level of threat as well. The first one said, hey, babe, no big deal. Hope you're having a great morning. My water just broke. Next text said, hey, sure would be great if you could give me a call. Doesn't seem super serious, but it feels like we ought to go to the hospital. 
Next text, are you getting these? <laughs> Next text, all caps, all caps, what are you doing? <laughs> and then the final text was, do you enjoy your life? If so, call me now. <laughs> so um, I quickly, you know, called her. I was like, hey, I'm, you know, I rush home. I'm, I, she's standing outside uh, on the street. She already had like a neighbor come over to get our tears. She's standing there with her backpack, tears running down her face, being like, I thought I could depend on you. And I was like, you should have known you couldn't depend on me. Like you, <laughs> you should know, that, you know, I was like, no, no, no. Oh my gosh, I'm so here for you in this moment. Um, I broke every traffic law that there is to break on the way to the hospital. Uh, I was flying. I mean, I was zipping through, using, I, I mean, the, any, any area that you could fit a car on, I was like, this is meant for transportation. Uh, stop signs were only an encouragement, you know, red lights, they were just a suggestion. I mean, anything and everything you could do to break the law, I was breaking. And I wish, I wish I could say it was for the health of our child. It was not. I wish I could say it was out of love for my wife. It was not. It was only for my own life. That is only why I broke the laws. And I honestly thought, okay, if my wife has this baby in this car, um, I don't feel like we'll stay married. And I'm pretty sure I won't be living uh, past this incident. So I was really committed to getting there on time. Um, we did, everything turned out fine. But the, uh, but the situation, the desperate nature of the situation called for these these, this way that would have otherwise been unacceptable that was now seen in my mind at least acceptable. And you have situations like that, right? Where, where the, the, the desperation caused you to do things that you look back on and go, whoa, that was crazy. Um, I, I actually, I wanna talk about desperation today. I wanna talk about what do we, what do, we do in those seasons of life? We, we, don't, we don't really like those desperate situations you know, nobody today is going like, man, I wish I was in more of a desperate situation. No, they're not, they're not fun. We don't enjoy them. Um, there are usually hard situations in life. They're usually difficult circumstances in life. But I wanna specifically talk about not just desperation in life, but I wanna talk about how does desperation fit into a relationship with God? And I recognize some of you have a relationship with God. And then there may be others of you that you're just not quite sure what you think about God. Maybe you're not quite sure what God thinks about you. Maybe you're just not quite sure what to do with faith or whether or not you should even have faith in a God that would even allow the circumstances that would cause the desperation to, to rise. In fact, let me just ask this question. This is kind of a, um, it's a leveling question because regardless of your religious beliefs, regardless of your religious background, whether you consider yourself a Christian or not, everyone has had a situation where they felt desperate for God. When, when was the last time you felt desperate with God? Can, can you think of that moment when you felt like, you know, that situation where you're like, God, if you don't come through, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Maybe it was a job you were trying to get. Maybe it was a check that you needed to come in the mail. Maybe it was approval that you needed for something. Maybe it was to get into something. Maybe it was some kind of health scare. But it's usually those situations that feel out of our control where we feel like, God, we need this outcome to go the way we need it to go. And we feel desperate for it. What, what's even sometimes more challenging is not just the desperation we feel with God to move on our behalf, but sometimes we feel actually desperate for God. When was the last time you felt desperate for God? God, more than needing approval for this, more than needing the outcome to go my way for this, more than needing the check to come in the mail, more than needing this to clear up, I, I need you. I mean, I need you. I need to know you're here. I need to know you got me. I need to know that I've got you. That's what I wanna talk about today is I wanna talk about those moments in life where we're completely out of options, where we've run out, we've tried everything. We're gonna look at this story that's found in um, this one particular chapter in one of the accounts of Jesus's life. It's in Mark 5, um, if you have a Bible, you can turn there. If you have technology on your, front, on your phone that you use as the Bible, I would love for you to open it up because I wanna read this, 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 this account of this relationship that somebody had with Jesus, this, this interaction someone had with Jesus. In Mark 5, there's actually three of them. And in all three of these stories, we're only gonna look at the last one, but in all three of them, these are stories of people who were 
desperate. They didn't have anywhere to turn. They didn't have anywhere to go. They didn't have any options left on the table. They had tried everything else. In some of their situations, everything had been tried on them. And in every one of these experiences and every one of these instances and every one of these interactions, it's showcasing the type of person that Jesus rescued then. And I believe the type of person Jesus still rescues today, even in the middle of our desperation. My hope is that it's gonna be a little bit of maybe a map for us, a little bit of a pathway for us to know what do I do with this desperation that I feel? The story that I wanna look at is about a guy who's a religious leader. I mean, this guy was buttoned up. This guy had it all together. And this guy had no doubt sought solutions that were beyond this world. He had tried every solution that was in this world and he was now looking outside of his own world. And Jesus, in this interaction, no matter what you think about him or what you think he thinks about you or what you feel about him, here's the best news of the day is that Jesus is going to prove more personal than ever, even to the one who knew religion, but knew that religion could not provide all that he needed religion to provide. And Jesus shows up and meets him personally and intimately. And that is great news, no matter what your background is today. And my hope is that maybe today, that if you're feeling that sense of desperation today, that this might inform the way you choose to approach God. I told you all of this is out of Mark 5, and we're gonna jump into the middle of the chapter He had just had this experience with this man that they don't even tell us this man's name. We just know him as the demon-possessed man. How about that for a nickname, right? The demon-possessed man. And the story was Jesus took these demons and he cast the demons out and cast them. He looked around. It was as if he was going, where do I put these demons now? And he cast the demons into this herd of pigs, 2,000 of them that then ran off the cliff. Bad day for bacon. Jesus, uh, after he leaves that situation, he crosses a lake and he gets onto the other side of the lake, and that's where we're gonna pick up this, this, uh, this particular day in the life of Jesus. This is Mark chapter five, verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. This is, this is a common theme in his life. There's always people pressing, always people wanting, always people desiring, hey, help me figure this out. But for whatever reason, this one particular man, his name is Jairus, he, he gets chosen out of the crowd. He steps out of the crowd. He, he somehow gets Jesus' attention in the middle of the crowd. One of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He's just immediately begging Jesus, I've got a problem. And he was a synagogue leader. So here's what we would have known about this man. He probably wasn't a rabbi. So he wasn't on the the pastor side. He wasn't on the helping people out, uh, navigating their spiritual life side. He was on the operation side. You know, any any ministry or any synagogue or any church, it's 51% ministry and 49% business. You know, you got people that work there that help figure out, okay, how do we train the people and how do we hire the people and how do we pay the people and how do we order resources and how do we make sure that everything's moving along so that people can have the experience we want them to have. And that that was Jairus. And so he would have been a man who, uh, he would have had a lot of respect in this community. People knew of him. He he was a man of great stature as we're gonna see later uh, in, in this story. But he was someone who was facing a hopeless crisis. So hopeless that it drove him to his knees begging with all earnestness that Jesus might intercede into his crisis and cure the problem that he was facing that he couldn't fix on his own. Here's his situation. He pleaded earnestly with Jesus. He said, my little daughter, my little daughter is dying. Please come, put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. My little daughter's dying. I I feel this personal connection to this story. Fortunately, our, my little daughter's not dying, but we're gonna learn in this story that his daughter was 12 years old. We we have a 12 year old daughter. 
So a couple months ago, when I was reading through Mark with some friends, I got to this chapter and, you know, just the reality of, oh my goodness, as much as I love our daughter, what if she was dying? I mean, what kind of desperation would I feel? And some of you, some of you have been there. Some of you know what it's like to lose a child. I'm looking at you right now, thinking about some of the services that I've been to with your kids, with your loved ones. You know what it's like to feel that sense of desperation. God, if you don't come through, I don't know what I'm gonna do. The way Jesus responds to this, it's just so simple so personal, but so beautiful. I love this little line. In fact, for some of you, this might be the line that sticks out for you today. It's simple. It's not profound, but it's powerful. Look at what Mark, look at how he just simply put this. He said, so Jesus went with him. He went with him. Hey, I I am so sorry. I'm not making you any promises. I'm not telling you what's gonna happen. I don't even know how hard this is gonna be, how challenging this is gonna be, but if there is a mess in your life and you are inviting me into the mess, I'm in. I'm in. And Jesus went with him. And he'll go with you too. If you invite him in, he will say yes. And so this large crowd presses in, continues to press in around him. In fact, that's the very next line of this account. And Jesus has this other interaction with this woman, this this woman who, just like the man who was possessed by a demon, this woman had her own situation. She had this medical issue that couldn't be healed. She had spent all of her life savings. She was an outcast. She had done everything to try to fix this, and she couldn't. She had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. If, if, If you haven't listened to the sermon that April Farmer preached at North Point, uh, it would have been a couple of months ago. It's still on the podcast. It's still on the website. You have to go listen to it absolutely remarkable. And April talked all about this woman, talked about the desperation that this woman was feeling. And what's so interesting to me is that Mark tells us that Jairus' little daughter is 12 years old and this woman had this medical condition for 12 years. And this is what's remarkable about the way God works is that 12 years previous to this particular day, Jairus and his wife welcomed their new baby girl into the world. Hopefully it didn't take 17 missed phone calls for Jairus to wake up and pay attention that his daughter is about to be born. But in his case, it had to be the most joyful, thrilling occasion. And yet at the same time, 12 years previous to this day, this woman realized that she had this medical condition. Maybe she was thinking it was gonna get healed quickly. Maybe she was thinking it was a minor bump in the road. She probably had no idea that she was gonna suffer with it for 12 years. When their baby was born, they probably had no idea that 12 years later that she would be lying on her deathbed. But this is the way life works, that joy and suffering often run on parallel tracks. And in both cases, it it escalated. It, it, It moved to a moment where God was going to prove how powerful he actually is. But this interlude in the story of Jairus, it had to bother Jairus. It had to drive him crazy, right? I mean, you know what it's like to have to wait When's the last time you waited on something? Do you realize we don't wait on anything anymore? I was in the bank the other day. I had to wait for like three minutes and I about lost it. I was like, how have you not automated this? Why can't the app do it? This is absurd. I'm sure they were like, sir, it's been three minutes. I'm like, I haven't waited three minutes in years. What are you doing? I mean, have you been through a drive-thru lately where they took forever and you're just like, get it together. Good grief. Do you not know how the world works? Like you just can't do this anymore. We don't wait. Okay, so fortunately, hopefully, Jairus had a little more patience, you know, than we have these days, you know. Uh, We're the society that burns our mouths on Hot Pockets, right? You know, like we can't even wait. Like it's so good. But 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 in Jairus's case, 
Hopefully he's over there, you know, able to be patient a little bit, able to wait, you know. But I'm sure after a while he was like, okay, lady, all right. Sorry about your bleeding, okay? It's gotta be rough for you. My daughter's about to die, all right? Can we hurry this up? Jesus, can you wrap it up? Like, I know you're being all kind and gracious and compassionate and stuff, but can you tell her to take a ticket? You know, there's a system here. Like, can you tell her, like, you'll get back to her, get her number and call her later? I don't know. But we were moving to something and things have slowed down. Have you ever been waiting on God? Whew, man, waiting on God. It's agonizing. She's like, God, it, it's gonna be too late. Like, do you know what you're doing? Like, we don't have time. We do not have time for this. And then the worst news came. As he's waiting, while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. And they said to him, they said, Jairus, your, your daughter, your daughter's dead. I'm so sorry. We, we just got the news. We came straight from your house. I, 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 I don't know what your plan was and what you were trying to do with Jesus. And I know you had a lot of hope that maybe that might help, but she's already dead. I'm so sorry. And, and then, then they ask him this question that I don't, I don't know if you've ever used these exact words, but I felt this way and I'm sure you felt this way before. They, they said, why, why bother the teacher anymore? Why, why would you bother? Like we get, you were bothering him when there was an option because you wanted him to help, but now there's no option. So why would you still bother him? Have you ever felt like you're bothering God? Have you ever prayed for something so earnestly and so consistently and so faithfully Maybe even it was already over. Maybe the paper had been signed. Maybe the deal had been done. Maybe it already closed. Maybe you'd already lost it. It didn't happen. But you felt compelled to still ask him, God, come on, come on, come on. Can't you come through? Can't you undo it? Can't you change the outcome? I feel like I'm bothering you, but can't you please come through? Here's one of the things we learn about the way Jesus responds to Jairus is that Jesus does not seem the least bit bothered by Jairus. And I hope today that you take a lot of comfort in the fact that God is never bothered by you. He's never bothered by you. He's not annoyed at you. Your desperation does not turn him off, put him off. He, he loves it. He welcomes it. He invites it. And Jesus overheard, he overheard them ask him this question and you know, it must have triggered him. Because he, he, he looks at Jairus and he tells him, he says, Jairus, don't, don't be afraid, just believe. Afraid of what? Af afraid that the reality of what you just heard is actually true? Afraid that you won't be able to handle the terrible news you just got? Afraid that this is the end of the story? No, 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 no. Don't, don't be afraid of any of that. You just continue to bring your desperation to me. And then he gives us this little tidbit, which I don't, we don't have enough time to even uh, explain it or dive into it or even understand it. But he, he, Jesus did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And there's a number of reasons why that might've been happening, why he might've said, okay, I can't take all these other people. But, but, he, but he, he, he took the crowd and he slimmed it down to these three people that he knew believed deeply in what he could do that had left everything to follow him. He takes these three people. There has to be something there that matters or something there that means something. But when they, they came to the home of the synagogue leader, he saw all the commotion with the people crying and wailing loudly. And there, there's, there's a lot of historical context to this. People would actually pay people. They would hire people to come and mourn whenever you lost something or someone. And this really tells us two things. It tells us, number one, that Jairus was a man of wealth, that he had wealth and stature in this community because he was able to gather a crowd of wailers and yellers and screamers and criers and and. and people mourning the loss of his daughter. But it also, it not only tells us the, the wealth and stature of a human, but it also tells us how deep the loss was. 
that they were obviously just completely heartbroken, devastated, just wrecked over the loss of their, their daughter. Of, co of course. But Jesus goes in and asks this question that throws everyone off. He goes in and says to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child's not dead. The child's just asleep. Now, this was a euphemism. In, 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 there are times when they use sleep as a euphemism for death. And at the same time, Jesus uses them interchangeably like he's speaking to the future the future reality of what his resurrection is going to actually bring. That in the same way that when you go to sleep, you wake up the next day, that in this life, we're gonna go to sleep and wake up in the next life fully healed and fully resurrected and, and fully without any blemish or pain or any evil or any tears. But surely everyone in this moment, they, they didn't know that, they couldn't get all that. And so the haters, well, they do what haters do, right? I mean, what do haters do? They hate, that's what haters gonna do, right? And so the haters were there and the haters, look at what they do. They laugh at him. They mock him. The, in the presence of the almighty, not a square inch anywhere on the planet, anywhere in the universe that he does not rule. All dominion and authority has been given to him. He's able to do anything and they laugh at him. They mock him. And so he puts them all out. He's like, I ain't got time for this. Y'all out, 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 all of you, out. He puts them all out. And he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and he went in where the child was. So just picture this if you can. I mean, it's, this is hard to experience the depth of this pain, but you, you can imagine Jesus takes the father, takes the mother, and he goes into where this girl is. There she is, laying there, lifeless, breathless. I'm sure Peter, James, and John were like, what are we doing in here? Like, we don't know these people. Like, this feels very personal, very intimate. So they probably like hung on the back wall. The father, Jairus, the mother, they probably just broke down again. It was the first time that at least Jairus had seen his daughter who was dead. And Jesus, as we're about to learn, kneels down I just imagine him getting eye level with this little girl and he grabs her hand and he holds her hand and looks at her and with all compassion and all command, he tells her something. Here's what Mark tells us, that he, he took her by the hand and he said to her, Talitha kum. Fortunately, Mark translates this for us, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. You don't speak Aramaic. I don't either. But if you say it confident enough, people think you do, you know? I don't even know if that's how this is pronounced. I'm gonna go with it, but I don't really know. But what we do know is that it means little girl, get up. And it doesn't just mean like, what's up girl, like friend. No, it's like a tender, a tender designation for someone that you love, like a father would say to a little girl, like a grandpa would say to his granddaughter, I mean, just imagine this dad is standing there and as Jesus speaks these words, Talitha, kum, he probably had this flood of memories coming back of all the times he would have said that to his own daughter. She's one year old and she's learning to walk and her little, her little legs are wobbly like a little deer standing up, you know, trying to figure out how to walk and she takes a step or two and then she falls as one-year-olds are prone to do. And the dad probably looks at her with so much compassion, but so much authority and says, Talitha, come, come on, you got this, stand up. Or maybe she's five or six and she's playing outside and, and the dad's like doing some yard work and he sees her and one of the kids bumps her and she falls down. And maybe she's kind of hurt and she skinned up her knee and the dad's trying to instill confidence and he looks at her and says, Talitha, come on, come, get up, you can do this. Or maybe, I mean, she's 12, so she's at that age where she's starting to sleep a little late, you know? And so maybe it's like a, a Friday morning and it's been a long week and she's gonna be late for school and he goes into her room and opens up the blinds and gets some light in there because she's about to miss the bus. And he's like, Talitha, come, hustle up, come on. But it's loving, it's my little daughter, tender, I love you, compassionate, but it's authoritative. It's an imperative. Get up. I say to you, get up. 
And this is Jesus. All the care in the world, all the compassion in the world, but all the command in the world. He says, I tell you, get up. And you know what happened? Immediately, immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. I mean, these parents, could you even fathom? I mean, they're overjoyed, elated. There's not an adjective to explain it. Mark tries, he says, no, I, I, no, at this, they were completely astonished. They couldn't believe it. I can't believe God did this. And Jesus gives strict orders for them not to let anyone know about this. That's another story for another day. And then he tells them, hey, get this girl something to eat. Why is nobody on their way to Chick-fil-A? Like, come on, like get her some nuggets, get her some waffle fries. Like, what are we doing here? Like, let's help her out here. Come on. I know for some of you, maybe you're thinking, well, God hasn't done that for me. Maybe some of you are in the middle of a situation where you're hoping, you're praying for this kind of resurrection. But for all of us, I, whether we're in the middle of a desperate situation or not, I think this teaches us something that has the opportunity to help us understand what to do about our desperation, how we can approach God. In fact, that's what I wanna do just for the, remaining few minutes that we have is what, what does this interaction with Jesus teach us about how we can, not should, no, how we can, how we get to approach God. What do we do with that desperation that we feel? God, I need you to come through. What do we do with all of that? How does God feel about all of that? Here's the first thing we learn is that God, God isn't turned off by your desperation. God's not turned off by your desperation. In fact, God welcomes your desperation. This is what always baffles me about God is that God has this reciprocal nature about himself. When you draw near to God, James tells us that God draws near to you. When you return to God, what does God do to you? He returns to you. When you seek after God, what happens? It's in the seeking that you find God. Now, this is not the silver lining. The silver lining is not, oh, and they got to know God better. No, that is the main thing. That the desperation, that God is not going, whoa, 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 whoa. Get it to God. I need a formal prayer. I need more these, more thous. You're approaching the throne of God. Be careful. You're on thin ice. No, no, no. He says, come on, bring it, all of it. The emotion, the anger, the feeling, the desperation, bring it all. He's not turned off by it. He's not put off by it. No, he says, come on, bring it all. He loves your desperation. He loves it. We, we also learned that God isn't, he isn't put off by being your last resort. I mean, as far as we know, Jairus was like, I mean, if this doesn't work, I don't have any other options. It, it seems like he had done everything else. The bleeding woman, it seemed like she had done everything else. This demon-possessed man, it seemed like he had done everything else. And at their last resort, they're like, I mean, I guess I'll try God, you know. Some of you showed up today for that same reason. You've tried everything. You've tried it all, and it hasn't worked. So you're like, well, I guess I'll try God. See, as humans, we don't like that, right? I mean, have you ever been invited somewhere, you know? It's like a dinner party, and you're like 12th on the list, but it's like the top four friends, and you're like, whoa, how did I get in that? And you kind of want to ask, but you don't want to know, you know? It's like a golf event, you know, it was a foursome. And you're like, I'm not even that good of friends with them, but like, it's the master. So what am I going to do? You know, so like, I get, this is crazy. And you, you want to ask, hey, I'm just curious, how many other people did you call? Like five, seven, eight, what was it? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm great, I'm in. Like answers, yes, but I'm just curious, you know? Was I the last resort? Like, was I the last one? And see, that kind of might, that might bother us about someone that might, because we're humans, but God, he's not insecure. God's not put off by the fact that he's your last resort. He's not gonna be like, oh, did you already go to the doctor and that didn't work, huh? <laughs> oh, okay, oh, you went to the chiropractor as well. Okay, did that do anything? Oh, the acupuncture as well. Okay, how did that go? You even went to get your tarot bread? Is that a thing? Oh, you did that too? Okay, well, that's even, okay, well, we're gonna really have to talk about that. How dare you? 
I am not gonna let you live any of that down. I'll help you, but I'm gonna remind you about that every single time we talk. No, he doesn't do any of that. He's just like, come on, I, I, I'm, I'm fine. If I'm your last resort, that's fine because he's not insecure. He just wants you. That's why he loves your desperation. He just wants you. In fact, Jesus, when you decide to turn to him, what you're gonna find is that he's a safe refuge even if he's your last resort. He'll never make you feel guilty. He'll never make you feel shame. If you feel any of that, it's from somewhere else, but it's not from him. Now, the last thing we learn is that the, the desperation, it deepens your relationship with God. That's what it does. That's the, that's the best part about the desperation is it deepens your relationship with God. I mean, imagine Jairus for the rest of his life. I'm sure he just felt so connected to Jesus. Of course, Jesus healed his daughter, but even if he hadn't, he would have had this experience with Jesus that would have changed everything. I mean, did you hear what happened to the daughter, by the way? Have you heard the end of the story? Some of you are like, what, what verse is this? No, it's not in there. I'm just telling you, I know what happened. She died. I, I don't know how long it was, but I'm just telling you, the daughter died because there's a one-to-one -one ratio. Like that's what happens, you know? Like she did eventually die. I mean, maybe she got, maybe she lived long enough to where she got to, you know, experience the joy of a wedding. Maybe she got to have a child or two or three or how, whatever. I mean, maybe she got to do a lot of great stuff and made Jairus a grandpa and all this stuff, but eventually she did die. I mean, we, it's not about she lived. That's not the point of this because we do all eventually die. And I'm not making light of the fact that sometimes people do die. It is hard and painful and we miss them, but we are all going to die. But how sad would it be that while we're alive that we miss out on the greatest joy of life, which is knowing him. See, Jesus, Jesus showed up, but it wasn't just to enhance the circumstance. In fact, that's not even what God, God doesn't just want to enhance your circumstance. He doesn't just wanna come through so that your life will be better. He doesn't just wanna come through so that you'll experience the joy of getting into the school or having the deal go through or experiencing the joy of the, 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 uh, the relationship that might happen out of it. No, no, he just wants to develop and deepen your relationship with him. That's the whole point of it is that he's powerful enough to move. He's powerful enough to resurrect. And in the middle of your faith in him to come through, you get to know him. And you don't have to wait till it gets really bad. You don't have to wait until you're at your wit's end. You don't have to wait until you're at the end of your rope. What if, what if, what if you decided to turn to him now? What if he was your first response as opposed to your last resort? How much more would you know him? How much more would you get to walk with him? How much more would you get to experience his love and his grace and his presence and him accepting the invitation? So why not? Instead of just waiting, why not? Just come to him now. Bring all the desperation to him now. In fact, don't even wait until you feel desperate. Just go ahead and start now by saying, I wanna let you know I'm all in. I wanna already be all in. And you might be at a place where you're at the end of your rope. I am so sorry. What's remarkable is that God sometimes uses the end of our rope as the beginning of hope. And maybe that's where God has you today, that he wants to instill hope in you as you put your trust in him. Not that he'll come through, maybe he will. And unfortunately, as we have all experienced, sometimes he doesn't but pray for it anyway. God, would you bring that kind of resurrection to my situation? and pray for it desperately, pray for it with passion, beg him, you're not bothering him. No, bring it all to him. And as you do, you're gonna get to know him in a way that you wouldn't otherwise get to know him. And that is the best news of it all. That's what God wants us to do with our desperation. Heavenly Father, I pray that, um, God, all the situations right now, God, that are in limbo, I can't imagine how many of them there are where people are just hoping, wishing, praying, begging, come through, come through. God, I pray that you would. I pray that you would bring resurrection to relationships and businesses and careers. 
You would bring hope to hopeless situations. And God, in all the places that it seems like you're not, or it seems like you don't, or it seems like you won't, God, I pray that we would find hope and joy in that deeper relationship with you. You have all, you have all the joy in the world waiting for us as we get to know you, as we deepen our relationship with you. That's the richness of life. That's the, the true way of life. So we pray that you'll come through. But God, even when you don't, I just pray that that desperation will lead to a deeper relationship with you as you've done so many times before. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks again for being with us today. Um, would love for you to participate with us through Give, Serve, Love with Be Rich. Go serve somebody, sign up to do that on our website, but also help out a teacher. You can fill out a card while you're here if you're still here to be able to do that. But have a great rest of your Sunday. We look forward to seeing you again and I hope you'll be back here next week. See ya, thanks. Slime